Facebook. So that's good. And and now we're calling Brando. You ready? I'm ready. Check, check, one, two. Check, check. Here we go. And we're live on Facebook, right? Yep. Live on Facebook. So we're calling Timmy B right now. Sweet. Hello. Hey, Tim, this is Gary and Chris. How are you? Hi, fellas. Good to be with you. Absolutely. So we've got about 15 seconds. So can you hold on for just a sec? Not a problem, and I'll stay with uh, Chris as long as you'd like. <laughs> That's wonderful. How are you, sir? Nothing good. Great. Great. Hey, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready, man. All right. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris on Local X. Right now, we want to welcome in a college football and basketball broadcasting legend. He was the first host of ESPN's College Game Day. He hosted College Football Today and at the half for CBS's SEC Game of the Week broadcast for 18 years. He currently hosts Football Saturdays in the South for Raycom Sports. They've won 12 Emmys in 14 seasons. And he's calling games for FS1 and Fox Sports this fall, who just added Big Ten football to the schedule. Now, he's one of the most recognizable voices in all of college football and basketball. He is Tim Brando. Mr. Brando, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Wow, you guys uh, read that just as I wrote it. Wonderful. <laughs> Good to be with both of you. Absolutely. <laughs> now, this is your first time on the show. And while we do want to get into the upcoming season and whatnot, I do want to get into some of your background just a little bit. Now, there's obviously a thousand, things, there's a thousand things that we could ask you. But I want to touch on this first. Can you give me an idea of when you knew that you wanted to call play-by-play -play for games and, and also be a studio host? Like, what made you really fall in love with sports? I don't know that I ever thought about being a studio host. My generation, uh, to put it in perspective for you, okay, uh, as, as a child of uh, the 60s, uh, there was no NFL today. I mean, Brent Musburger hadn't even started that show. And there was certainly no cable television. So, you know, your your introduction to sports was watching the games. The games were the thing. Uh, and Kurt Gowdy was doing the World Series, the Super Bowl, and the Final Four all at the same time on one network in uh, in the 60s and 70s. And the Final Four only went on national television uh, after the Houston UCLA game at Hoff that, that, that Roy Hoffines put together at the Astrodome in 1968, after the regular season game with what at the time was the largest crowd in the history of college basketball for Elvin Hayes and then Lou Alcindor, later Kareem Abdul Jabbar. And I was 12 years old then. So uh, those guys, Gowdy being the premier voice, there were others, uh, a lot of others, Ray Scott. Um, no question, Jim Simpson, who I later would work with at ESPN, he was uh, really the voice and face of, of ESPN uh, in its uh, earliest days. Uh, those guys were my mentors. Um, uh, I'm, I'm leaving out some, I know. I mean, um, uh, Lindsay, Lindsay Nelson was a great one. Uh, I mean, a tremendous one. And I, I really covet uh, back in 2014, I was the recipient of the Lindsay Nelson Award uh, that's given out by the Knoxville uh, quarterback club i think musburger got it a year ago and it's a, a, a real honor i mean to be in that in that uh, number to, to, to be a past recipient of that so we didn't have studio shows it was about being at the games the studio thing evolves that's something that um by the time i got uh to, to espn and started working for them in 1985 the, the studio thing evolved, and it really began with the NFL Today with Brent Musburger. There, there were shows like, for instance, in college football, the Prudential College Scoreboard with Merle Harmon and Bud Palmer. Later, Jim Lampley did it. There were shows like that, but they were always centered around scores and highlights, and that was about it. There was no produced, hour-long studio show where you did features and you had personalities and that's why College Game Day was such a novel concept at the time. Uh, and
And when I became, um, uh, when I left Baton Rouge and went to uh, Bristol, I really wanted to do games, but they, they said, hey, if you want to be a full-timer, you want to be a staffer, uh, you need to come up here and, and anchor for us some because we, we know you can do that too. And there's nothing, I think probably more than, uh, for longevity's sake, the greatest asset uh, a young announcer can have is versatility, uh, the ability to do uh, several different things, wear a number of different hats. Uh, and I was able to do that. And uh, the then boss that I had that, that uh, took my career from a play-by-play man just out there doing uh, games uh, here, there, and yon, whether it was in the Metro Conference or the Southwest Conference, then or the Big Eight or the SEC, to, you know, this idea of having a, an hour-long pregame show for college football, it had never happened. The networks had never done it. And Steve Weinstein, who was um, uh, the visionary of ESPN at that time, had this thought in mind. He wanted to have a staple event uh, studio show to to really kick off the day for college football. And he wanted to do the same thing with the NFL. And, and uh, I was sort of the, you know, for lack of a better analogy, <laughs> the, the Chris Berman was to the NFL what Tim Brando was to college football. And as someone that was young and, and, and very in, influenced by decision makers at that time, I was honored. I mean, I was really flattered. So that position sort of evolved, And uh, but I always wanted to do games. Uh, I was always, even when I was hosting the show, uh, I wanted to do games. I, I wasn't happy where I was. I had happy feet. I was chasing. I wanted to do games and was never seemingly that satisfied with being at an anchor desk. Um you know, the fact that I happened to be good enough at it, that someone wanted to hire me specifically for it, I, as I look back on it, I wish I'd been more grateful uh, for the opportunity. But I was in such a rush to do games that, uh, you know, I didn't think about it. You know, when you're young, you're just trying to get ahead and move and, and, uh, and without promoting yourself too much, just try to do a good job and, and hope that your assignments improve over time. Um so the industry changed, and I was a part of it, and uh, I look back on it now with, uh, with glee. I mean, I'm very proud to have my name associated with what I did at ESPN at that time. I don't look back uh, at all, though, because I knew what I was doing when I left it was for my own personal and professional good, and it all worked out in the end because now, you know, it took me a long time. Even at, even at CBS, it was a funny <laughs> thing. It took really getting that job for me to appreciate what ESPN had done for me. Um, I was calling games again in 1996, 1997, doing uh, Raycom's Jefferson Pilots uh, SEC Games of the Week, and I was calling the Braves and the Hawks and working for Turner and the NBA in the time that I'd left ESPN. And uh, when when they hired me at CBS initially, it was because everybody had left CBS to go to Fox because they had gotten the NFL in 1994, so it created a few opportunities. And that, that, that got me the job. But then when the NFL came back to CBS in 98, uh, Jim Nance had to go back and do the NFL today. And he had been doing the college show and that created an opening there. And, uh, and they said, Tim, you know, uh, you're pretty identified as a studio host for college football. We need you there. So, and that, that was a great run too that lasted, uh, you know, all the way to 2013. So, uh, I, I did some games, as you know, when we had double hitters. Right. If Vern wasn't doing the game and we had two games, I did the games. Um, but there was no real guarantee that when Vern was done that I was going to get that job. And and uh, I had gotten to a point now, I'm, I'm sort of in my late 50s at this point, and uh, the opportunity arose for me at Fox, and I'm doing exactly you know what I want to do, calling college football and college basketball. And after, you know, I'm, I don't even do a radio or television show anymore on a daily basis. I'm not doing any sports talk of any kind except guesting. But hey, this is the first this. time really in my career <laughs> when I've been at that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the first time I've, I've ever really been able to say I'm only doing exactly what I want to be doing. Uh, I think at, at some point in my career, I was always doing a few things that I felt like maybe I needed to do or should do, but I wasn't necessarily jacked up about doing now uh i've reached a point and and fox has enabled me to do that to say hey tim here's what you do you live in this lane okay you're one of our college football guys you go do that and then you're one of our college basketball guys you go do that 
and uh, I'm thrilled to say that um, you know it's been a long lasting career as a result. But 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 Gowdy was my my um, my hero as a, a broadcaster. Uh, other than my father, my dad was in television. He helped put uh, local television stations, two of them, on the air in my hometown. A writer, producer, uh, uh, an advertising agent. I mean, he did it all. They, uh, all these guys that were my parents' age had to wear all all the hats. You know, they had to be a jack <laughs> exactly. of really all the trades. And I grew up knowing in a local television station what I wanted to do for a living. So I can't remember the exact time that I knew I wanted to be a sportscaster. But as a child of TV, I can remember watching uh, the Red River shootout in 1961, 62. Army, Navy was Staubach and Stitchway. I was gravitated to live TV. And I think anybody that was maybe six years old in 1962 could understand where I'm coming from. The fact that you could turn on your TV and see a live ball game. And then watching the guys do it, uh, like Gowdy, who had this masculine voice, a real man's man. And then on Sunday afternoons, he did a tape show on ABC called The American Sportsman, where he's out with celebrities, you know, in a duck blind, drinking bourbon and shooting <laughs> geese. You know, I mean, I think it was geese. might have been, no, no, it was ducks. If you're in a duck blind, it's supposed to be ducks. So yes. <laughs> uh, I thought, what a cool, what a cool life to have. You know, what a cool uh, business to be in. And uh, so I followed that path. And and with the help of um, good timing and um, a father that was uh, well aware and was also connected in the business, told me what uh, to do and not to do. Sort of like having a professor in your house. Uh, it helped me get going started. Uh, really got, helped me get started early. I was 14 when I did my first high school football play-by-play, and I did it with my father. Uh, we were a father and son play-by-play team in That's 1971. That's an awesome story yeah. right there. That's great. Well, playing off that, what's your most memorable game that you can remember calling? What stands out most about it? I mean, what what is an event that you were like, man, that's it? <laughs> like that's the one. <laughs> there are there are so many from the NCAA tournament that uh, in those years that I worked them uh, for CBS, I, it, I would be leaving out a buzzer beater. You know, I had I had a ton of them. But one in particular I had in 1998, I was working alongside Al McGuire, the late great Al McGuire of Marquette fame, won the national title in 77 and basketball's first flower child. He was a unique individual. I think of all the greats in broadcasting and dynamic personalities I worked with, and I worked with them all, you know, from, and I still do work with Bill Raftery, who I think is maybe the all time best, um, you know, from generation to generation, but. Vital, McGuire, Billy Packer, you name them, I worked with them. Uh, uh, Jimmy Valvano, uh, who was, um, uh, sadly, his career was cut short, but he was, God only knows how great he would have been had he lived a full life as a broadcaster, not just a coach and a personality. But um, You know who I remember the most with him? I I remember Joe Dean the most. Oh yeah, that's so, my it, SEC day. It, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. it was great. Great yeah. with you. We did a ton, and, and and his father, of course, was the father of SEC basketball, uh, Joe Dean Senior, who worked with John Ferguson in my earliest days watching TV in the '60s and '70s. I grew up on watching Joe's dad, you know, and uh, Mr. Converse. But there, you, you name the guy that you connect to college basketball. I probably worked with him. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. At some point, but but Al was a Renaissance man, and you could learn a lot not just about the business, but about life if you were with him for three or more weeks. And I was for about three years. We worked the NCAAs together, and uh, he was in the twilight of his life and his career. And uh, so we're doing this game, and, and Stanford uh, is is playing for the right to go to the Final Four against Rhode Island. Uh, Rhode Island had a couple of great guards, Tyson Wheeler and Catino Mobley, the, the big cat. And uh, and Stanford had uh, the Mad Dog, Mark Madsen, and oh, yeah. uh, Arthur Lee, and a lot of other you know really good players. And they're down by six with about 50 seconds to play. Jim Herrick is coaching Rhode Island, and Mike Montgomery is coaching Stanford. We're playing in St. Louis. And just this you know incredible number of wacky, crazy plays happen including a steal off an inbounds pass and a pass to Madsen from Arthur Lee for a dunk and a foul and a three-point play. 
to give Stanford the lead. Uh, they wind up winning it at the end. It wasn't a buzzer beater, but it was just a bizarre way for the game to end. And I'll never forget, I'm on the air with Al, and uh, he, <laughs> he, the, the Stanford kids are going nuts, and they had a mascot that was a tree. They still do. <laughs> There's uh, a tree, yep. It's a big fur tree, and Al is out of, at the, on the court dancing <laughs> with the tree. <laughs> and I, awesome. I remember... Um, I remember I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having to talk while he's dancing, and, and that might have been the most difficult thing for me to describe. <laughs> Al McGuire dancing with a tree. <laughs> and the team, obviously. Oh, yeah. Dancing with the team and the tree. That, yeah, I, was out in, that uh, was a, that was I was a, in Stanford about three weeks ago, and, uh, and yeah, the yeah. tree is everywhere. Everywhere. It's everywhere. You can't get away from it on the farm. That's why they call it the farm. they got a lot of trees. Oh, yes. But uh, it was – that was a blast, and, and football, there, you know, not as many opportunities. I'm, I'm asked a lot about uh, uh, you seem to be, for someone that's been in the business, uh, so energetic and passionate. And, and really, I think the truth is, as much fun as and as much as I got out of being in the studio those years, I was always like a caged animal wanting to get out to call the games. And uh, even though uh, I'm, I'm considered a... a you know, a veteran, uh, and that might be a nice way of putting it uh, in this business because I've lasted so long. I sort of believe that my best football is yet to come. I don't think that uh, I've even really scratched the surface. I've done a lot of meaningful games, important games, uh, but not the kind of games that resonate in my mind to the extent that they should have. So, uh, that's why I feel so blessed now to be doing what I'm doing every week. And, you know, the best way of putting it is this, fellas. Uh, somebody will say to me, uh, gosh, Tim, we miss you in that studio on, on CBS. And I'll tell them, oh, I appreciate that. And, and I was part of it for a long time, and it was great. And that Florida-Alabama game when they were one and two oh, yeah. was tremendous. And, and uh, the, the, the Iron Bowl and the kick six – I was in the studio for the highest rated regular season game in the history of college football. But guess what? They don't replay halftime. You know, they don't <laughs> replay true. the pregame. That is true. Uh, that's that, you know, Vern, Vern, uh, God bless him is another one I looked up to and, and, uh, and he had a wonderful run and, and was very deserving of that. And, uh, when Fox talked to me about coming to work there, uh, in the summer of 14, gosh, it was in about this, I had only inked the deal with them in July of 2014 um, to go there. And when they were talking to me about coming, you know, when you're 58, uh, you know, executives don't necessarily get a lot of credit for hiring someone that's been in the business 30 years and is 58 years old. So I, I feel really blessed. Uh, the, my business, just like the coaching profession, is about you. And it's a, a young man's game. And I... I remember my boss, John Entz, at the time, as I was going through their executive car wash, saying to me, uh, well, Tim, where do you see yourself here? And I said, well, you know, I, I, I see where you're evolving and you're growing your network. Uh, you got a four-year-old cable operation here, and you're trying to grow it. Um, in 1985, when I started at ESPN, they were nine years old, and they were trying to grow uh, through college sports, college basketball, college football. Um, you know, I, I look at where you are in your evolution as a network and where I am uh, in my career at this stage, and I hearken back to where Jim Simpson was in his career uh, as, as the number two guy to Kurt Gowdy at NBC and what he meant to ESPN. And I think about my, my friend Vern Lundquist, who had never been a number one guy. He, would all, he was the number two NFL guy, and really it was a demotion when he got the SEC gig. They hired Dick Enberg at CBS to come over after NBC lost the AFC. And, uh, and they gave Enberg the job that, that Vern had and said, you know, as a golden parachute, here's, here's the SEC, Vern. Well, I think that was the greatest thing that ever happened in his career. Oh, absolutely. I mean, think yeah. about what happened with the SEC when he went there. And uh, so it, 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 timing and, uh, and your ability to accept decisions, and be okay with them and move on because you can't always control what goes on around you. Uh, Vern was the best at that. And uh, 
So when he said to me, where do you see yourself? I, I thought about Simpson and I, and I said to him, uh, you know, you got great young talent here. Gus Johnson is tremendous. He's got a wonderful following, big time voice, made his name on the NCAAs. He got these really great young guys coming up. And I, I see that, but maybe you need a guy that's been in it for 30 years and has a lot of contacts and, um, has, has a voice that's associated with the sport. And, uh, I, I see myself as maybe being in the position Vern was. Oh, so I, said, I literally said this. I, so I, I said, let me be your Vern. Let me be Fox's version of, of Vern. Uh, because that's really where I saw myself with the idea being, I can help you in certain areas and, uh, and maybe young producers, young directors, guys that are trying to, you know, uh, uh, get their uh, their bones earned, as we like to say in the business. Maybe I can help them a little bit, and uh, and and obviously that clicked it was something they like hearing, and and uh, I just re upped with them for another four years, so I'm very excited about it. Well, that that kind of leads us into another question, uh, and we got to bring in Chris Valiga here in about ten minutes. But it, Tim, you're going to stay on with us if that's okay with you. Um, sure. He, sure. He is Tim Brando. You can catch him calling games on Fox Sports this year. They just added the Big Ten. They've already got the Big 12. they got the Pac-12. Uh, make sure and check them out. Hosting Episode 3 of Football Saturdays on Raycom Sports this Saturday. Now, you said you joined with uh, Fox Sports back in 2014. You recently signed a multi-year extension to keep calling football and basketball right. at Fox. Now, your voice was synonymous right. with SEC football for years. Uh, tell me, what's the biggest difference between SEC football and the Big 12 and Pac-12 that you've been calling for the last few years? It's more of a way of life in the Deep South. It's something that uh, defines the lifestyle of people in our part of the country. I mean, I live born and raised in Shreveport, Louisiana, and when I left Connecticut, I moved my family and my wife, uh, what will be 39 years in October, back to my hometown. You know, I, I, it, it's authentic when I call it Chateau Brando. I mean, that, that's <laughs> this is where we live. And uh, I, I really firmly believe that, in our profession, you're gone a lot. So when you come home, you better be really excited about being home. And, uh, I learned a lot of lessons about myself and about life in the time that I was in Bristol. And, uh, like I said, I value that time. And I, I wish I had appreciated what we were accomplishing at the time we were accomplishing it more, but I certainly do now. And any of the ESPN lifers that are out there, many of whom got cut a few uh, years ago and even more that got cut uh, about a month or so ago, my heart goes out to them because I know how hard they worked and how they built that place uh, and made it, you know, the sports broadcasting empire that it is. And I appreciate that fact. And I think my colleagues um, in sports broadcasting, whether they work at Fox or anywhere else, also appreciate uh, what ESPN accomplished. They should because it's um, – one of the great what is one of the great success stories of uh of this century in my mind oh, but oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, that that being said that being said i i don't i don't know that um uh, i don't know that at any point in time uh for me anyway did i did i feel that not being happy uh that i could be unhappy in this business I, I never thought about that. It never occurred to me that if I was doing what I loved, it didn't matter where I lived. They, you could have sent me to Timbuktu. It, when I was 25 years old, I thought you could send me anywhere and I'd be happy. Uh, but I found out that wasn't true. Uh, Southerners <laughs> take for granted what it's like to live in the South until they leave. It. And, and, I, and I really did. Uh, I, I miss the humidity. I mean, I miss sweating. I miss the idea that, that, I mean, I really did, because uh, in the Northeast, if you're a Southerner, you might not see the sun on a daily basis until, you know, late June. Uh, it can be dark and dreary and and cold, and it was just tough. It was very difficult. I think the hardest winters they had were the winters I was there. Uh, and I moved back home, and I, Southerners... Southerners, I think, believe from a college football standpoint, because there's not as much pro sports. You know, up in the Northeast, no matter how good it is at Boston College or how, how good it is at Rutgers or how good it is at Penn State, there's always Philadelphia or the Yankees or the Phillies or the 
uh, Red Sox. It, it, it's a pro sports world that they live in. That's right. And in the South, largely, largely because most of the pro sports franchises didn't move South until I was about 12 years old. You know, the Falcons, the Saints. All those teams came in in the 60s, 67. I was about 11 years old when those teams were brought into the league. As good as those teams might be, and the Saints won a Super Bowl, for crying out loud. But I don't know that the passion for the Saints will ever be as strong as the passion for LSU in Louisiana. Oh, I mean, I don't. I don't. Same would be true for the Falcons and, and the University of Georgia. I, I don't know that – I would think a Georgia national title would resonate more oh, well, than a Falcon Super Bowl. Yes, it absolutely. No doubt about it. Yeah, no question. So I, I think that's what separates uh, the SEC fan fan from the fan of the other of the other locations, uh, whether it be Pac-12 or um, uh, or any, you know any other league. Now the Big Ten's got some pro sports areas, but I will say their history, and this is one of the things Fox is so excited about, the history of Michigan and Ohio State and now with Penn State and the Big Ten and really flourishing, uh, those are homes that are going to be watching FS1 and Fox for college football for the first time this year. You know, uh, college sports is really regional. You know, I got fans in my own hometown that think I retired because I'm not doing the SEC. <laughs> you know, they, they're like, well, well, Tim, we really loved you. You, uh, you you're in your Barker Lounge now? What you doing with yourself? And I'm like, well, I'm on every Saturday. I was just in Austin, Texas, doing the Texas Tech Texas game. Oh, I miss that. I think I was watching LSU exactly. or Alabama. Who was that? <laughs> so I mean, fans are fans of college football. Very provincial, very protective, and uh, understandably so. That's what makes it great. So uh, you know, the, that's that's probably also the biggest difference between the NFL and, and the college game. Uh, you, when you're doing a college game, it may be national meaning it's available to everyone, but largely, you know, you might be getting a 60, if I, if, let's say, for instance, I'm doing um, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. We had Bedlam to close our season last year. Did a great rating. It was on the same day as all the championship games, and it was big because the winner was going to go into, um, you know, one of the New Year's Six games, but they, they weren't going to be in the, in the college football playoff. But we, I mean, in Oklahoma City, uh, we were probably getting 80% of the homes. And in Dallas, we probably got 60% of the homes. But when you got outside that area, there's it, nothing. It just doesn't, it, there's, yeah. I mean, it doesn't so resonate. college football, yeah, college football fans believe their school, their team colors are the only ones in the country. That's all that exists. And it defines who they are, not just as, um, as fans, but as human beings, they believe that their team is their way of life and the opponent is the villain, the ones that are trying to infringe on their way of life. Oh, absolutely. Which makes it both fan, which makes it great, but also sometimes frustrating because um, they don't always see the big picture. And we're all, you know, announcers are always trying to tell people the impact of this game will resonate. Here's why. It can impact where this team goes in the next ranking and blah, blah, blah. And I think some fans get that, but they're still on the learning curve trying to get it. Yeah, I do agree. All right, now we have to take a break for just a second. got to get Chris Fleek in here. Uh, we're going to run a few ads and whatnot. But, Tim, you're cool with, uh, with hanging out for just a little bit? Oh, absolutely. Good deal. All right, uh, let's see. Give us 30 seconds. Uh, coming up next on Winning Cures Everything, we've got Chris Felica from ESPN's College Game Day. And we're going to keep Tim Brando which is a nice surprise. So we'll be back on Winning Cures Everything on Local X. So, Tim, I was going to say we're, we're kind of we're on Facebook Live still, so just an FYI, but, uh, but we're, we're going to cut this part out. When you were talking about what ESPN did for sports and, and these sports channels, I kind of – we're Gary and I are in the age of – we grew up with Tiger Woods. And what he did for golf yeah. changed golf forever, changed the money in it, changed everything about it. I think ESPN, right. while they kind of get dumped on a lot today, in our generation, our generation mocks ESPN for how they've kind of handled things the last five, six years. And, right. and man, I, I really think that um, if it wasn't for them, you don't have FS1. You don't have – 
uh, CBS Sports. Oh, sure. CBS, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, no. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I, 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 I agree completely. Um, I mean, there's absolutely no denying that. Yeah. Absolutely. Careful, no careful, denying. Careful the jokes you make because those are the guys that built the foundation for where we are and, and what yeah. we want to do. So. Yeah. I, I, uh, I agree completely. Absolutely agree completely. Uh, I I don't know. I don't hear anything in my ears, so. Man, we appreciate you staying on. The stories you've got are Hello? unbelievable. Hey, Chris. So, yeah. <laughs> have I got Tim, too? Tim, we yes, you do. How are you? Wonderful. Are you? <laughs> is, the, is the bear there? I got the I bear. I am ready to roll. <laughs> this How are you doing, buddy? This is fantastic. I'm good. I'm good. Let's see. All right, let's see. Give uh, give me 15, and we'll roll back in. Chris, I'm going to go ahead and intro you, and then uh, Tim will bring you back in as well. So we'll uh, we'll divvy up a few questions and see if we can get uh, get answers from both of you. Perfect. You got it. Three, two, one. Welcome back in to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris on Local X. Joining us on the show is the research producer for ESPN's College Game Day. He provides stats and information for the on-air and production crews uh, leading up to and during each week's telecast. He does the Bear Necessities segment on the show. He also co-hosts one of our favorite podcasts, ESPN's Behind the Bets podcast, uh, during the football season. You know him as the Bear. He is Chris Felica. Chris, myself, my co-host Chris, and Tim Brando. Thank you for coming on with us. <laughs> I, I absolutely looking forward to it. It's going to be a, a good time. Hopefully, the first of many. That's now. Tell me this: Have you two done an interview together before? No, no, we no. have not. We've crossed, we've crossed paths on the road many times, but uh, have not done anything together yet. So this is the first. No, uh, we no we haven't. And I will say this: uh, I'll give you a little quick history lesson on uh, the foundation of, of ESPN. There was no research department at ESPN in 1985. <laughs> all right. Um, now they they acquired a research department on the basis of of College Game Day becoming a reality. Um, they had some guys that they used um, uh, for for the USFL, and uh, they didn't have any programming. I mean, in those days, other than college basketball, the only live programming they had was Australian rules football. Okay. So there wasn't a lot there <laughs> to work with, but when, when you, you got to go back to the university of Georgia and Oklahoma lawsuit against the NCAA, they were carrying in the mid eighties um, in 1983, 1984, Jim Simpson, Paul McGuire were doing college football games on tape delay because they didn't have the rights to, to doing it live until Georgia and Oklahoma filed a federal lawsuit that the Supreme Court ruled uh, in favor of an antitrust case to enable cable television to carry uh, college football as the schools got the rights away from the NCAA. I mean, all the talk about uh, the BCS and college football and and uh, you know all the rhetoric for the last thirty plus years. I've always had to remind people of this, but that's that's really what happened. And it was just as I was beginning my career there, calling games. And uh, the first research guy hired was to, his job was to do college game day, was Howie Schwab from Stump the Schwab thing. And, Y'all were and talking Howie about this on Twitter built, today. Yeah, <laughs> how, yeah Howie, Howie built an empire of research, including... Uh, John Coleman'sberger, who worked with me at CBS, JK, we affectionately call him. There, there's countless examples of guys that came from uh, the Howie tree, and and Chris is an, uh, is another example of that. Uh, you know, you're like Howie, someone who had a major impact on my career path and, and really uh, mentoring me and just my, my passion for college football and college basketball. And obviously, those are two things that were are near and dear to Howie's heart. And, and Howie was somebody that I certainly tried to emulate and, and, and take after and uh, always try and pick up bits and pieces of knowledge on things to look for and how to do things and uh, and really make uh, the, the on-air personalities and uh, the telecast itself as it, it best it can be. And there are a lot of people on that building and a lot of people, like you said, are no longer in that building that uh, 
that old Howie a, a, a debt of gratitude, that's for sure. And now, Chris, that kind of leads me into you. Now, we did this with Tim before, and since uh, both of you are first-timers, I, I wanted to start at the very beginning with you. Now, you're from Long Island, New York, right? It, I can understand mm-hmm. the love for gambling, but how in the world did you get involved <laughs> with college football? It's, it's actually funny. Um, a lot of my family is uh, northeastern, uh, eastern Pennsylvania, and were rabid, avid Penn State fans. Okay. So my, my first love of following for college football really was uh, knowing that they went to Penn State and had an affinity for Penn State, and, and kind of they got me in, involved in the passion of that. And then uh, I think the 87 Fiesta Bowl, I should say, uh, I was about 14, 15 at the time, and really I had started to, to pick up on Miami right when, uh, when, when, when Howard won the national title and Jimmy started to get things going. I kind of gravitated towards them as I got into junior high and high school and, uh, and, and followed them, and they became my favorite team, and it's actually where I wound up going to school. So uh, it, it's kind of a weird uh, uh, Penn State got me into it, and then I became a Miami fan and then I lost to Penn State. And so uh, kind of kind of a, real, <laughs> a weird circle of life right there. Absolutely. So you've been. Uh, so if there's no if there's no Pete Giftopoulos, <laughs> there's no Bear. <laughs> yeah, there, 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 no, there are no five any touch of uh, intercepting. There's no uh, no DJ Dozier. None of that. Uh, I love it. I so, love it. So this is the 30th anniversary of College Game Day. It all started 19. Uh, it started going on the road 1993. You've been with ESPN since 1996. You're discussing gambling lines. Um, and that didn't start until 2015. Yeah, I was about think. to say, you didn't really start doing that until recently. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, well, here, let me let me jump in here. Um, you didn't start discussing the gambling lines until 2015. What What went into gambling lines and odds being included in the coverage of college football, not only on game day, but also on ESPN? Like, was it difficult to get passed through? And, and by chance, I, I, did you have anything to do with that? I, I think for a long time we insinuated it in such a way, and, and Lee Corso with his closer than the experts think, and, and trying to throw in, <laughs> and Chris Ballard trying to subtly throw in uh, little Vegas slants and, and, and tips and things like that. Well, Musburger was and always here, big with it. Like oh, he, of course, and then of course the Al Michaels with the with the with the great. He goes over the goal line for the touchdown. And he, it was out there, and I think finally, uh, I don't want to say saner minds prevailed, but people finally just realized and understood that there is a large facet of our audience and viewership that they're watching the show for information to, to bet on games, gamble on games, pick games. What, and, and even if you're not a, a gambler, it, it's interesting to uh, to get a note about a perception of uh, this team is expected to blow out this team or this team is an underdog and not expected to win, but when they are not expected to win, they usually do pretty well and are capable of pulling some upsets. So a couple of years back, I think we finally just came to the realization, you know what, we're just going to do it and we'll we'll push it as far as we can. If we get asked to scale back a little bit, we will. And, uh, and, and it just became a little unique element where once we went to three hours, uh, Lee Fitting, the producer, and, and, and Kirk Erskine had been wanting to get me involved for the longest time and and Lee really came up with the idea of just saying, you know what, let's give you a board. You're going to pick three games a week against the spread, and we'll and we'll see how it goes. And uh, it's been a lot of fun and a good way to try and uh, implement some of the, some of the, uh, the Vegas and gambling nuggets in there. Right, well, no. Chris is speaking to something that let me let me let me throw this caveat in. Okay, there would have been no college game day. There would have been no college game day had there not been a yearn from the people in television that there was an audience therefore gambling and gambling only for college football. Okay. Right. Uh, especially the Northeastern audience uh, and, and the paternal thing, his background being where it was and being a New York guy, uh, Penn state was sort of the team of the East for a long time. They won all those Lambert trophies. It was Schwartzwalter at Syracuse and, 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 and paternal at, uh, at Penn state. Bino was all over this. Okay, and everything that Corso picked up, uh, and he listened very closely, okay, not only to the executives that hired him, and I did his audition tape. He listened to those guys. He knew what Steve Bornstein, who was our uh, president at the time, wanted. 
Hold and on. I got to interrupt Bill you. Creasy. Did, did you, uh, do? you You might remember that name. Do you remember that name, Chris? You've heard the name Bill oh. Creasy, haven't you? I, sure, I, sure no, you I, 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 yes, I, 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 I think so. Yeah, you know what I'm talking more about. Than one, I've been to more than one Belmont Yes, yes. <laughs> Tim, did you guys, say that you did guys, Lee Corso's? Did, did you do Lee Corso's audition tape? Yes, I did. Good. Yeah, I, did, <laughs> I did uh, pretty much everybody's audition tape back in those days. Uh, <laughs> and it was either going to be Pepper Rogers or it was going to be Lee Corso. Wow, Pepper and Rogers. And Pepper was a great storyteller. Pepper was a great storyteller, but, but Lee was ahead of the game in terms of speaking in sound bites and in absolutes, and they loved that. Uh, and he also listened. And Creasy, who had Bornstein's ear, kept saying, listen, there are ways to tell the better which way to go without laying the number. And closer than the experts think was something that, you know, Lee fashioned off that. But he also listened and learned from Bino. You know, the whole, and I, I've had this conversation with Fowler many times. You know, Chris was doing Scholastic Sports America when I was doing it. And a lot of people don't remember, but when I stopped hosting game day, I, I didn't get replaced by Chris Fowler. It was Bob Carpenter for one year. Uh, who's now doing Washington Nationals baseball and was calling <laughs> games like I was. I mean, Chris was so young, I don't think they knew he was ready to take it. But he was built to host it, and he made that show what it is. Editorially, I don't think there was anyone more gifted and, and better for that show at the time, and he took it to the next level. As I, as I told you guys earlier, I, I had happy feet. I wanted to be at games even when I was hosting game day. But – but, but Bino was willing to be the butt of the joke. That was the other thing. You know, if he had a bad week picking games uh, and he went 0-6, we'd put him in a manhole cover in Manhattan with a hard hat on <laughs> and make him look like a fool. And Bino didn't care. He was like, you're always making fun of me, Brad, though. Why do you do that? <laughs> well, I go 6 at all. You're going to have to buy me dinner at the 21 Club, for crying out loud. He... he we dressed him up in all kinds of outfits. We didn't have much of a budget, but we did have costumes in those days. And he, we'd put him in anything, and he'd do it. And Lee, who, <laughs> Lee Corso, at that time, uh, Chris, was our Kirk Kirkstreet. You know, he, he was the X's and O's guy, but he had a great personality. And he watched Bino like a hawk. And I know you've probably had these conversations with Lee. Uh, and one of the things I love about him is he's not, never forgotten his roots. He learned a lot from Bino, and at a time in his career when maybe his star power would have been fading, and Craig James came in first, and then when Craig uh, Craig came in my last year there, and I was hosting um, half times and in between games, it had become a two a two uh, guy deal back in those days, uh, and Tarico replaced me in '94. But my last year in '93, I'll never forget this. Uh, we had all these conversations, Corso and I did, driving from our hotel to uh, the, the airport. And uh, and he said to me, he said, you know, if you're going to stay in this business, you better learn to be the butt of the joke. I love that about Bino. And look what he did. Uh, he, he became the crown, uh, really, I think, the prince of, of Saturdays. I mean, I, I don't care what anyone says about what he went through medically, okay, uh, but what that did after he had those strokes uh, and what he, and how he's tried to bounce back by staying on the air, not only was, you know, admirable for him and for ESPN to retain him, but it also brought a human quality from Chris and from Herbie because you could tell they were helping him and it made them, it humanized the whole show. But that last segment, fellas, Chris, I'm t- that last segment, I want Lee Corso and Lee Corso only to do that last segment with the headgear. I mean, that is, that's become the five minutes of television that I don't miss and I don't think anybody misses. Oh, no, and it's the highest. Go ahead. Go ahead. Chris, you jump in. I was, I was, I was going to say that yeah, everyone who watches the show and will talk to me about the headgear and every, and their, their comments are similar to that. And that is the, five or seven minutes of the week that they just don't want to miss because they don't want they have no idea what he's going to do next he's going to come riding in on a bison he's going to be <laughs> tackling bill murray with the spear he's going to be dropping f-bombs by accident <laughs> you can, uh, yeah it's un, it's unbelievable and you you hit on something uh, in him and watching and observing bino 
he always reminds us, and week after week, he, he says, we are in the entertainment business, college football. Yes, absolutely. Year. So he absolutely yes. gets it that you need to be funny, be humorous, give a little football, but make sure you're entertaining the public, and, and, and he's done it so, so well. So, yeah, I mean, just don't take yourself so seriously. And he, he saw that from Bino, and he took it to another level. Um, you know, B- Bino was incredibly insecure, maybe the most insecure man I ever met, but it drove him. And he gets through doing something where he was the butt of the joke, Chris, and he'd say, Brando, do you think I went too far? Is it over? Will I ever work again? Are they going to bring me back? Is it over? I mean, and Lee just laughed, and I did too, but... But but the the key for Corso's uh, endurance has been his willingness to get you know he knows a lot of football I mean he knows he a ton uh, and most of it most of it most people in America don't see now but the guys like Chris that are there each day and are watching the build up and a part of the preparation they know how much football he imparts to Chris and to Herbie or excuse me Reese and Herbie and everybody else I wish people could spend. A, a game, actually go to the game with him on the sideline. It, it's like he's still yeah. coaching. He's out there inside right. the hash just and, and just to, to walk with him and just he's he's still quick. He's, the observations he has, are, it, it's unbelievable. And you're right. And, and you mentioned about Chris and Reese and, and Herbie, and it really is – I don't want to say special or touching, but that's kind of the right word and to, to, to see how – if Lee forgets a word or kind of gets loose in his train of thought a little yeah. bit, they're right in there to jump in, massage it, make it seamless, and, and just kind of catch him right up, and, and, and he gets right back with so up. And uh, for those who didn't watch game day prior to Lee having a stroke, and when we went back and did some of the anniversary footages and a piece on Lee and some of the old moments when we reminisced, you talk about a guy that was quick-witted, and sharp oh, yeah. on it, and the sense yeah. of humor was, and that's the that's the one thing that unfortunately, and he hasn't fully recovered from. But other than that, he is the intelligence and the observations are still so so good. Now we've we've got about yeah. twelve yeah. minutes left in this, so let me let me hop in. I want to get a couple of questions in that are actually here. You go ahead and knock this one out first. So being on a show like Game Day, you're making picks against schools because you're always going to pick somebody to win. That means somebody's got to lose. Which schools do you guys recognize give you all the most pushback on Twitter and social media? And so, <laughs> Chris, go ahead and, and you jump in first, and then Tim, I want you to jump in after. <laughs> uh, I would say I would say there were two last year that kind of gave me a little bit of grief. Uh, the first one was Florida. And, and I think maybe it's a lot of people associate me as a Miami alum. And I don't know why Florida fans were giving me grief for picking them to lose most of the time because I picked them to win the SEC East. I picked them to, to beat Tennessee, and they wound up blowing a, a double-digit lead and losing. And any other times I picked against them, they got blown out by Alabama, they got blown out by Arkansas, they got blown out by Florida State. I was kind of right. I blew it in the ball game. I did pick Iowa in the ball game. But, uh, and, and then I think Oklahoma, just because I, I've been a little bit – critical of just the, the big 12 in general being the fifth of, uh, number five of the power five conferences and just saying how I didn't think uh, Oklahoma with those two, those two losses, the, the committee wasn't going to forgive that. And, and I think as Oklahoma continued to win and win the conference, um, and, and I just said, Hey, this is how it's going to be. They lost to Ohio state. They lost to Houston. The big 12 was the fifth of the power five. They're not going to put a two loss conference champion with, with no out of conference wins in and, and I think they took a little bit of offense to that. So I think you, I think Florida and Oklahoma would might say. You are not the only person that has told us Florida. We had uh, I don't know if you know who Funny Man is, but we had him on last week. He's an Alabama comedian and he told mm-hmm. us that Florida is the absolute worst to him. It's not Auburn, it's not Tennessee, it's not L S U, it's Florida. That they are on him like dogs all the time. All right, now Tim, you, you make a lot you are the one that goes like out of out of this world with some of your picks, right? And and we appreciate that because you don't stick to the status quo. Well, it's easy to pick Alabama and Ohio State every year, right? So now with you, like what what makes you want to pick those? You know, just you picked uh, Louisville, I think, what in twenty thirteen to win the national championship when nobody had them. Yeah, like, when they had right when they you, had Bridgewater at quarterback. Yes, so that was based on schedule. A lot of that is. Um, 
my preseason picks are not about where teams, I believe. That's not a starting grid. It's where I think they'll wind up, and usually it's about schedule. A little bit of the ghost of Vino that's still within me. You know, I spent all those <laughs> 6 o'clock uh, uh, breakfast at the Plainville, the Plainville Holiday Inn. You know, they didn't even have friendlies across the street, Chris, when I was there. So um, there was a lot of dark mornings there with Vino. It's all about the schedule, you know, and uh, – so that's part of it. I don't pick games regularly anymore because I don't have a radio show uh, any longer. I retired that a couple of seasons ago. But uh, I would say blowback is always going to be there. I don't care. Every school's got you know the 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 whack job uh, fans. They're, that's just part of it, which makes it great. I mean, it's both the the difference with me and other guys that do what I do is I actually engage some of these 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 nutcases uh, on Twitter and, and and it's fun and we love it. I really you know it's fun um, but but uh, but you could pick Alabama you could pick Alabama to win the national title okay but but with a loss and piss off most of their fans okay just by saying they're gonna win it all but they're gonna lose a game. Yeah, you're such an LSU homer. You're this, and by the way, my daughter's my one that went to LSU, and one that went to Ole Miss. So I'm screwed no matter what if I pick anybody but Alabama. Or and and if you don't pick Alabama to cover, you know you might as well be sent to a third world country. So um, Michigan, I think, is the 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 Midwest version of Alabama. I think both of their fan bases are the ones that are the most offended. If you piss them off, Ohio State's got their fair share, but they're not quite as 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 vile uh, as as Michigan. Alabama, it's a love hate kind of thing, though. I'll, I'll I'll say this: there's not a town in that state that's got a population base of five thousand that doesn't have a Monday lunch or Monday evening quarterback or touchdown club. Okay, whether it's <laughs> Aniston, Gadsden, Muscle Shoals, you name it. And I've probably, at one point in time, probably, Chris, going back to my early days at ESPN, I've spoken to all of them. All those recent Davis <laughs> corridors, I've been to them, okay? And I've, I've met and they love, they love the, to be poked, you know, and they enjoy me poking back. So a lot of it's just in good fun. You know, I, I prefer to, uh, to, to poke the bear, so to speak. No pun intended. <laughs> All right, now we've got about five minutes left. Let me get in one last question. Now, this will be a, a gambling question, but it kind of works for both. Uh, Chris, let me go on and get your answer on this. Um, here, you go ahead and jump in here. And then, Tim, I want yours afterwards. All right, so for me, when I was in college, I remember betting, you know, that was when I first started gambling on stuff. And the Dallas Cowboys, every week, one season, whether I bet on them or bet against them, I lost. They were just – the absolute killer for me. Did you, Chris, you, you do a lot of betting. I don't know if Tim partakes so much or if wants to put that out there. No, I really don't. But no, uh, I, I love talking about it, but I don't. Well, well do, you, do you remember, Chris, having any team that just you were snake bit, no matter who you pick, when you pick them, that you just always lose on them? Uh, I, I think there are. I, I think in, uh, Oklahoma State is a team. What when I've when I either picked off, picked them in the column, or picked against them in the column. Uh, they're they're a team that I tend to have very very little success with. I mean, I, I picked them to, to to beat some teams, and they they would lose as a big favorite. I picked them to, to to get blown out in Bedlam or beat Baylor, or, and, and it would go completely the other way. But uh, yeah, I, I think Oklahoma State would be that one team in terms of the column in the podcast that I just have a. Uh, a hard time putting my finger on. Now, Tim, when you would make predictions, you know, on, on the radio show and just wherever, on Fine Bomb Show and whatnot, mm -hmm. it, were there any teams that just always seemed to do the exact opposite of, of what you wanted them to or what you predicted? No, no, I don't, I don't think so. I never, it, it, I didn't, it didn't matter that much to me. Uh, so I, if, if it happened, it wasn't that. Im the, one of the great things about Chris is that what he does, and I, and I love the logic to this, uh, Reese and, and the guys on the set love him getting the pushback. So it keeps them from getting nailed. You know? <laughs> you know? I mean, it's a great right. statement, but he also, he'll always be beloved by them. Okay, so it's one one less thing for them to get, you know, a lot of pushback on. But, but I, I'll say this. Uh, everyone remembers when you miss 
They never remember when you're right. They love pointing out. Now, here's the great, uh, this is what levels it all out. And again, I go back to, to my old friend, Bino Cook, on this one. Uh, he always used to say, if you're wrong, admit it. Just tell him you, you screwed up. It's, you, know, you, you were wrong. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, note the, the Catholics versus convicts game. Uh, I lost the bet to Bino. I said there was no way he had gone zero and six the week before, <laughs> and I, I wish they good. included. They should have. They should have included the Catholics versus Cleveland. Gary, I'm sorry, that was not a fumble. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I I told him he was out of his mind. He was out of his gourd. Miami was going to win the game, and he looked at me and he pointed the finger. I was one of the highlights of our early days of game days. Brando. If Notre Dame wins, you go sing the victory march in front of the team. And you know what? The following week, I did it. The following week, I flew there and did it. And when, whenever you're wrong, when you fess up to being wrong, America loves it. So a lot of times, it's the way you react to being incorrect that wins over people. That's the other great thing about you, Chris, uh, that I really enjoyed. I watch the show. If I'm not doing a noon or 1230 game, uh, I'm always watching game day. I mean, I don't miss it. And... uh when you've had a rough week, you admit it. And that's what makes, uh, you know, sports television great, you know, and, and separates it from, you know, news and political genre. It, you know, the, the people won't stop saying that they're right and everybody else is wrong. In sports, when we screw it up, we can say we screwed up and win some friends as a result. And that's one of the things I admire most about not just the show, but specifically the role you play. No, I appreciate that, and, and, and yeah, I certainly admit. Like last year, I got off to a terrible start, and then I, it, 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 I wound up finishing thirty and nineteen on the year on the board, which is pretty, pretty darn good. But yeah, I mean, it's it yeah. amazing early, early on when I mean, he couldn't find anything. To, I'm like, hey, well, I'm sorry. I mean, it's it, it is what it is. And you you touched on that Bino story about an underdog, and that's something still that always resonates with me. It's always in the back of my head. If I if there's an underdog out there, in, in Bino said all the time, if you like an underdog, just pick them to win outright because if they lose, no one's going to remember it anyway. Or you just you're wrong. That's right. But if, but if he, you're right, the underdog if the underdog pulls the upset, then you're here. That's why you pick Mississippi State to beat A and M. They win A and M number three in the BCS or whatever it was in the college football playoff, and there's a great. couple digit road on or road favorite, and they lose. That's a one. On Notre Dame, awesome. I finally said to him. So as I said to him, I said, Kyle, Bino, how did you get that? How, how did you, I mean, look back at Catholics versus convicts, how that game went. There was no denying Miami had the better team. He said, Brando, Notre Dame has the best home field advantage since the Kremlin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my Hot gosh. Down Jesus, for Christ's sake. Never better. <laughs> All right, look, we are, we are running up on the hour, so let me go ahead and jump out of here. You guys have been Absolutely fantastic. Uh, he is Chris Felica from ESPN's College Game Day and the Behind the Bets podcast. You can follow him on at uh, on Twitter, at Chris Felica. Uh, he is Tim Brando, the legendary Tim Brando. Follow him on Twitter, at Tim Brando. These are the easiest Twitter handles ever. And, uh, and catch him on Saturdays this fall, calling games for Fox Sports and FS1. Big Ten games are now included. And catch him on football Saturdays on Raycom Sports. Uh, Tim, Chris, thank you guys so much for jumping in. We got to get both of you back on again sometime soon. This has been fantastic. Thank you guys. Anytime. Really enjoyed it. It's been an honor. My pleasure. Absolutely. That's going to wrap it up. Winning Cures Everything on Local X. We will see you guys next time. Guys, that was awesome. So I I cannot thank you guys enough. That is perfect radio. (laughs) It was a lot of fun. Well, I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it. And Chris, it was a real pleasure to finally get to have some dialogue with you bud i'm a fan oh, totally absolutely I'm more so than just passing each other in the arena of the acc tournament or uh an SEC championship <laughs> game or something like that and just kind of give a give a quick wave and a hello and, a, and away we go glad we can yeah do that for well you guys. give my best uh <laughs> give, give my best to the guys i'm doing a couple of friday games in september in the big 10 um so if i if i happen to be near where you guys are i might just you know Come over and crash your party. Oh, that would be great. So. But we'll we'll be in we'll be in Columbus for the for the Oklahoma game. I'm ninety nine point nine percent certain of that. I don't know if if there's a, if you're doing a game in that area on the on the Friday before that game, but uh, 
Well, I would think that it's highly likely we'll be in Columbus for week two. Well, so. I'll have my I'll have my head on a swivel. Put it that way. Perfect. Right? Perfect. Okay, we'll buddy. See you some point Good down talk the road. to okay, you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. It. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to y'all later. You bet. That was awesome. Facebook, you got an awesome show tonight, my friends. Absolutely. Unless, of course, it cut off. No, it's just...